Thank you, praise team, for leading us in this time of worship today. I want to take the opportunity to say we are so blessed to have you here with us today. If you are a visitor, we welcome you. I pray that you have filled out a visitor's card because I would like to send you my own personal text if 
if you don't mind, I know that they will be sending you one, so other people from our church, but I would like to personally send you one myself and tell you that we were proud to see you. I would like for our church to give all of our visitors a round of applause today because we are so proud to have them. I don't want to recognize all of you because I don't have the list on all of you, so, but I do want to recognize one person who have, I, I have known for many, many years. We grew up together. That slid in on the back seat this morning. Phyllis Sparks. We have run up and down the road many times together. We've slept in, on the floors together. We've slept in the back of that old bus together. And uh, not, hey, not really with her. Let me put it, uh, let me clear that up. That, did, that didn't sound very good, did it? <laughs> Phyllis, I've got to get that straight because that wasn't right. Uh, woo! How do I dig my foot out of my mouth there? You'll be up here someday. You'll stick yours in your, yourself. Children, you may be dismissed to go to your classes today. Today it is our honor to have a guest speaker with us. Before I get to that, I would like to say that if you need the nursery, we have someone in the nursery this morning that will be available to help take care of your kids or whether you can stay out here in the congregation and hear the message if you'd like to. So be sure and take advantage of that. Uh, if you need the nursery this morning, that's why it's here, it's for you this morning. It is my pleasure today to have as our guest a man I'm going to start calling the cardiac kid because he come in about 15 minutes late this morning and I was, my heart was way up in here because if you would have been in my place, and expecting somebody, you would know how I feel. You know, I, while I'm on that subject, you know, so when people don't show up that's supposed to do something, you and they tell us at the last minute, we're not going to be here. Hey, it gives somebody else a heart flutter this morning. So you're very, very important today to this church because it takes a village to make this thing work. It's just not me. It takes a village to make this work. Back to Brad, back to the cardiac kid. I'm glad he come to church this morning with a good clean haircut, aren't you? <laughs> Brad is a graduate of ATU. Brad is currently the chaplain for our hospice organization, which is such a well-needed position, and he really enjoys doing that, and God has blessed him in doing that. Not only is he as a chaplain for hospice, at the same time, he is running a business. This business is known as the Arkansas Sports Network. Uh, I have seen some of his stuff on Facebook before that he has pasted on there or put on there, and we appreciate reading some of his stuff. Brad has also served... Brad has also served as a youth pastor in Adkins and Huntsville Assembly of God, and he has worked on the Bethel staff. Beth is, Brad is currently married, and his wife is on the worship team at Hector Assembly of God, and he is not able, she is not able to be here with us today. However, he brought his two children, and we're so proud to have them with him. Brad is also well known by his family. The Caldwell family has been in this area for many, many years. Don't expect bad Brad to preach like none of these. Because even though he is a Caldwell, he'll probably tell you he don't know the scripture from front to back and memorize, have it memorized. And that's just because he wasn't in as much trouble growing up as they were because that was their punishment for being mean and doing bad things. But Brad... We are so proud to have you with us here today. Let's give him a big round of applause as Brad comes this morning. We turn our pulpit to him. 
With an introduction like that, buddy, thank you today for being with us, and God bless you. Appreciate you. Yes, sir. Love Brother Jim. You know, I actually have known Brother Randy longer than Brother Jim, um, but uh, Brother Jim and I have been talking now for about a couple years and, and just got to know each other and continue to get to know each other. And uh, Brother Jim is an inspiration to me. Last a couple weeks ago, uh, when I came over here, I tell you what, I haven't heard the truth in the pulpit as much as I've heard it from that message a couple weeks back. And I'll tell you right now, that's a hard thing to live up to, let me tell you. But, uh, you know, it, it's good to have a man that will preach the gospel, but preach the truth. You know, and, and it's, it's an honor and a privilege to stand up here in this pulpit. With, or for you, um, I will say that um, this morning, <laughs> I didn't know that I was going to have dad on duty duties. My wife, I will tell you, she had planned on coming with me today, but her brother sprang a wedding on her um, about, oh, I, I mean, when I say sprang, it was about a month, but what he did was sprang the date after we had already set the date. And so she had been gone. She is the praise and worship leader at Hector First Assembly. And so she was going to be here with me today, but just because of being gone as much as she had, she just couldn't do it this time. Uh, the next time we'll get her. In fact, I even said to Brother Jim, I said, we can reschedule if you'd like. He said, no, nope, come on. So I appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity to come and preach. I don't get an opportunity to do it that much. And so it is good. I mean, it, you know, it's like... Uh, Sunday morning when you get a chance to preach in a pulpit, it's kind of like Sunday morning playing a football game in the NFL. You know, it's, it's game time. It's go time. You know, it's a little different than preaching on Sunday night or Wednesday night. You know, and I know that that's not as a common occurrence anymore as it used to be. Um, for you in the back, if you're looking for my scriptures because I wasn't able to get them to you, I'm going to give them to you right now. Matthew 25, 2 through 12. Tell me, give me a thumbs up if you got that, okay? John 21, that's going to be the whole chapter, so I don't know if you, how much you want to keep up on that. John 14, 19 through 27. Matthew 22, 37 through 40. And I think that's it. There's a lot, a lot of scripture today. I will tell you that I had a thought going through my head all week long. I... I as he said, I'm a hospice chaplain, and I will tell you that my perspective being a hospice chaplain has changed over the last two years. I believe that God has given me some revelation, maybe just revelation for my own self, maybe it's revelation for everybody, but I will tell you in that I am still learning and cultivating the things that I try and, and believe. Now look, I have grown up on that church pew, just right here, right there. I mean, I, I have grown up. And I will tell you that throughout my life, I have felt like different things. You know, I don't want to go too far into that because I know that there's different beliefs in here. I don't want to trample on the message that I'm going to give you. But there are different things that I felt like that I knew in my life and then when you become a hospice chaplain and you're sitting beside the bedside of somebody and they're needing the Lord you look at things a little differently one thing that I know for sure is that I am a sinner and I have fallen short of the glory of God okay but not because I stand up here today doesn't make me any different than, than the person that's laying on that bed dying needing the Lord because we are all sinners. The Bible says that our righteousness is as filthy rags. So with that being said, there's something to be said about grace, that we all need grace in some way. Of course, you know, last time I come over here, I preached about the thief on the cross. And the thief on the cross, and you probably know the story of the thief on the cross. There were two thieves that were hanging on the cross beside Jesus. And one of them looked at Jesus, this is the short version of this, and looked at him and said, remember me when you come into my kingdom. And Jesus said, this day you will be with me in paradise. Then you look at Romans 10, 9, 
It says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus died and rose again, then you are saved. That is enough to be saved. Now, with that being said, all of that, I have, I have preached that to people that have been dying, and I believe it's the right message to preach because I believe that, that when a, a person is laying on their deathbed and they need peace, the only peace that they have comes from the Lord. And I can tell you, I have seen people that have rejected that and never had and never quite got that peace. I'll tell you, I had a man that passed away this week. For two years we spoke about things of God. And I'll tell you, I, I still today don't know where he went. But I will say this, I'm glad that I'm not the judge. I'm glad that I'm not the judge. That's why the Bible says that we, have to, we need a righteous judge to judge our lives. That's why the Bible says, excuse me, let every man work out his own salvation with fear and trembling. Oh, we, we love to quote that verse. I've heard that verse. Let every man work out their own salvation. They forget the part about the fear and trembling. We all need grace to get to the kingdom of God. We're all sinners. We're all wretched in some ways. Our righteousness, as I said, is as filthy rags. We've got to have grace. So this gets me to where I'm at today. I think I'm going to need some water. This gets me to where I am today. I've got two questions for you. The first question is, what does it take to get to heaven? I would say that that should, I know it's at the forefront of my mind. That, raise your hand if you think about that. I do, I think about it a lot. Now, again, as I've grown up, right here, sitting right beside this man right here, I mean, there's been a many a day that I've spent on the front pew of a church you would think that that question would be settled. And in some ways it is. But we have to work on that. And that's where I want to get to today. So my first question is, what does it take to get to heaven? And my second question is, do you love him? Do you love him? Matthew 25. And I guess I'll go ahead and read one through... I said 2 through 12, I'm going to go 1 through 13. I apologize. Matthew 25 says this. Thank you, sir. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept, and at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go to meet him. And then those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going to, going to go out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there be not enough oil for us, and you go rather to those who sell and buy in yourselves. And while they went to buy... The bridegroom came, and those who were already went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. And after the, afterward, the virgins came, also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say unto you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour which the Son of Man is coming. Let me pray. Lord, I thank you today. I need you today. Father, I am just a flesh man here trying to be a vessel for you today. I pray 
Father God, that you would move on my life today, anoint my words. Lord, I pray that I wouldn't speak out of line, but I would speak the words that you have given me. And I ask this in your name, amen. Now, that's my opening text. I'm going to come back to that in a minute, but let's just point a couple things out. There are 10 pure women here, 10, okay? Virginity is purity, okay? So there are purity. That, to me, virginity, purity represents salvation, okay? The bridegroom is coming. We, have heard, we know that at some point, we know the bridegroom is going to come. I believe that this is a picture of the rapture of the church. The oil in the lamps represent the Holy Spirit. But the verse that gets me, and this is, this is why I, when I think about, when I talk to people that are standing, and I'm standing by the bedside of them, and they're, they're getting ready to go into eternity, whether that be years and it literally has been. There have been people that I have worked with for as long as I've had the job, for almost two and a half years now. And then there are some of them that, that I stand beside their bedside. I'll talk about one in just a moment. That I know that they're not going to make it very long. Or maybe I don't know and they don't make it very long. Whatever it is, the one that gets me is, I do not know you. I do not know you. Verse 12, he answered surely. I say to you, I do not know you. Now, we can hang our hats on grace if we want to. And don't get me wrong. I believe in grace. The more I've done this, this position where I've been at, the more I believe that we get grace. We need to give grace if we want to get grace. But we have grace that we can hang on to. With that being said, I don't feel comfortable with hanging my hat on grace to get me to heaven. Think about it. I need something more. I need some assurance more than just grace. I, I mean, grace is sufficient. Grace is everlasting to everlasting. Don't get me wrong. We've got it. But the problem that we have with grace today, especially in the American church, is we hang our hat on grace and we just say, well, we've got grace and we just go do whatever we want to do. Right? We just go do whatever. Whatever it is that we want to do, there's no conviction because we have grace. Right? And so I have a problem with that. I have a problem with that. I, can't, I cannot hang my hat that... I am not going to go to hell because I've got grace. Now, folks, you, you might not agree with this statement or not, but I'll tell you right now, the flames of hell scare me enough to want to go to heaven. Okay? Eternal torment definitely scares me enough to go to heaven. Yes, I love Jesus. I do. I love Jesus. But I will tell you that there is a certain part of me that sure doesn't want to go to hell. Now that's something we don't even talk about that anymore in our, in, in our pulpits. But there is a heaven and there is a hell. If there's a God, there is an enemy. Okay, There's an enemy that's coming after your soul, trying to take you down there with him. And we have a choice to make. I, I, I'll tell you, now I'm going to get out here just a minute. Okay, Just a minute, let me step out here. I believe that when we are born, that we are, oh Lord, here we go, you ready? Predestined to go to heaven. Okay? Now, we can change that predestination by the choices that we make. Okay? Now, here's what I'm saying. I'm not saying that we are born and we go to heaven. Everybody doesn't go. But what I am saying is that the opportunity for us to be there is there. Here's why I believe that. Because when a baby dies, they don't go to hell. They don't go to hell. Their name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And when it gets down to that very thing, what is it that gets, your, gets you into heaven? It's, is your name written? That's, that is it. There's a new name written down in glory and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. Well, I believe that that's from birth. 
could be. How could a baby get into heaven? I'm, gonna, I'm getting deep. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. I see some people going, hmm, hold on. That said, I want to know what it is that gets me there. So let's go to John chapter 21. This is an interesting verse, or yeah, passage of scripture here. If you sit down and just really read what it says. So the Bible says this. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and in this way he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we are going with you. They went out immediately and got into the boat. And that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had come, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? They answered, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some so they cast it and now they were not able to draw in because of the multitude of fish therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter it is the Lord and now when Peter heard that it was the Lord he put on his outer garment for he had removed it Peter was in his underwear and plunged into the sea now that was interesting Peter was in his underwear. He put his outer garment on and plunged into the sea. I don't know what that was about. But the other disciple came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but uh, about 200 cubits dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they came to the land, they saw fire of coals there, fish laid on it, and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have caught. Now this is interesting. Let me just stop right there. I've got more to read. Jesus appears out of nowhere. <laughs> okay, now you've got to remember this is after the resurrection. Jesus just comes out of nowhere. Now, you know, how that worked, I have no idea for sure. I mean, at that point, you know, I believe that Jesus had the ability to go from place to place however he wanted to. So Jesus just shows up on the shore and he, he tells them to cast their nets on the other side. He'd already done that one time before, right? And it worked out pretty well for them. And when he told them to do that, they knew that it was Jesus. But Jesus already had coals and fish there waiting on them. And then he was like, hey, you know what? Bring some of that catch on and uh, come on. So that being said, Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to the land full of fish, 153, and although there were so many, the net was not broken. And Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord. And Jesus then came and, and took the bread, gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus has showed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And so when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. He said, Feed my lambs. He said to him once again, a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. And then, uh, let's see, I lost my place there. Peter was grieved. All right, he said unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things and you know I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. 
Now, Peter reminds me of my dad a little bit in this passage. My mom asked too many questions. He gets fed up. He's, he gets tired of it. You ever met my dad? You'd understand what I'm talking about. He gets a little bit sick of hearing it, a little bit. You know, you're asking too many questions. Jesus was asking too many questions, but we also know that when Jesus was asking questions, he was trying to make a point. This is what he was making. So Jesus said to him, do you love me? And he said, of course, Jesus, I love you. You know, it's like Brother Jim. Of course, I love Brother Jim. He said, hold on, Peter. He said, do you love me? He said, yes. Yes, Lord, I love you. You know, I ask my kids that a lot. How much do you love dad? You know, I get different answers. I got a good relationship with my children. You know, children, they change your life if you let them. You know, some people, they don't let them. You know, it's, it doesn't change their life. But for me, it did. It changed my life, changed my whole perspective on life. Everything about me changed. Literally, the minute that I saw my little girl, uh, for the first time, my life changed. I, you know, when I think about the love that I have for my children, it is greater and it is more abundant than almost anything. You know, when I think about the love of God, when I think that God loves me more than I love my children, that's hard for me to wrap my mind around. Think about that. You really love your children. Don't get me wrong. My children get on my nerves. When we put them in the van and they want to fight constantly, they get on my nerves. But there's nothing that I wouldn't do for my own children. I love them that much. Peter Looks at Jesus that second time. Yes, Lord, I love you. And the third time he looks at Jesus, or Jesus asks him, it says, Peter, do you love me? And finally, he says, you know all things, Lord. You know I love you. He said, feed my sheep. Now, the response is from Jesus, feed my lambs. Tend my sheep. Feed my sheep. You know, when you think about that, that's a picture of discipleship right there. Feed the babies. Grow them up to be sheep. Feed the sheep. Don't just grow them up to be something, but be the sheep. But it was more than that. It was more than that. It was more to Peter. He's telling Peter, don't you go back to fishing. Don't you go back. Oh, you can go out for a night and you can fish. But I've got a plan and I've got a purpose for your life. And it ain't this. It's to go out into all the world. And, and it goes down even in, into 18. He says, most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, you were girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you were old, or when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. Meaning, he's going to put you in handcuffs and they're going to take you to a place that you don't want to go. But he's saying that my purpose is bigger than even that for you. Don't go back to fishing. And even though the end may not be that great, the reward is greater. That's what he's saying to him. But he's asking him, do you love me? If Peter didn't love him, he would have walked away. He would have walked away. We have seen so many people in the faith today. They come down to an altar of prayer. They ask the Lord to forgive them. They go through the program. And then they get up from the altar and they never think about it again. You know, there's doctrine even in, in some of the, the churches that, that are out there now that, you know, say... You can come to the altar of prayer. You say your thing and then you're, you're out. I, I get this a lot when I, I talk to people. I get it a lot. My question is, do you love them? There is a certain standard that has to be to get to heaven. If there wasn't a standard, everybody would go. Everybody would go. And I, I wish that everybody did go. I do. I, I, even my worst enemy. I wouldn't wish hell on them. It, it's, it's not something 
that you would want to wish on anybody. But we all know that we, there's people that go there every single day. They go there. There's got to be a standard. There has to be something to get there besides just grace. Grace is wonderful. Thank God for it. But there has to be something there. John 14. We're going to do 19 through 27. And it says this, A little while longer in the world will be see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you will also live. At that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. And he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him And manifest myself to him. Judas said to him, Lord, how is it that you manifest yourself to us and not the world? And Jesus answered him and said, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. And he who does not love me does not keep my words. And which word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. And these things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you remembrance, all things. Peace I live with, leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, but I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither. Let it be afraid. There has to be a standard to get to heaven. There's something that you have to do to get to heaven. And that is, you have to love Him. You have to love Him. Now, it's it's one thing to say it. It's another thing to do it. And so my question is, are you in Him? Are you in Him? Are you with Him? Are you in Christ? The Bible says that if we are in Christ, we are a new creation. We are a new creation. My question to you is, are you a new creation? See, when we get saved, so, now, you know, I found this out, Brother Jim. I didn't know this because this happened to me. But not everybody gets that. They go to the altar and they feel that light feeling and all of that. You know, how many of you, when I say, I got saved and I just felt the weight of the world lift off my shoulders? How many of you felt that? Okay? Not everybody feels that. That's okay. I didn't know that. Okay? So I'll tell you, again, I've, I've been on a journey. I, you know, at seven years old, I remember kneeling right beside a, a church pew at seven years old and giving my heart and life to Christ. Of course, you know how that works. I mean, at seven years old, do you really understand what you're doing? I don't know. I knew I felt something that night that I needed to do. But, you know, as time goes on, we get, you know, we have our ebbs and flows when it comes to our spirituality. I mean, I remember being able to share, you know, my, my, my story at, at school and different things of that nature. But I also wasn't the, the best kid either sometimes, you know. We're like a, a high school boy, I was a high school boy. You know, and as time went on, you know, sometimes that relationship gets stretched out. And, you know, even at sometimes... You kind of walk away. When I was 24 years old, um, I just remember having this, this weight. It was just weight all on top of me. It was just, just, I couldn't escape it. And I remember there was about two weeks there that I couldn't sleep. And I don't even know what it was exact, exactly, except I had a friend of mine, which y'all know him. Uh, he's preached here before, Jeremy Prohaska. Me and Jeremy used to run around a lot. You know, Jeremy has a story himself. You know, if you knew Jeremy as a young man, he was a little bit wild, you know. He was a little bit crazy. But, you know what? He's an anointed man of God. He's a great preacher now. 
So Jeremy and I, we had run around a little bit, and we were playing ball off in Louisiana, and everybody's kind of talking about what they want to do and what they're going to do when they graduate school. And, you know, I'm there, and I haven't graduated. I'm 24 years old. I haven't graduated college yet. And I'm, I really don't have a, a real direction at that point either, which was terrible, <laughs> you know. Somebody should have told me something at that point. But I said, I don't know what I want to do. And Jeremy looked at me and he said, you're going to preach. And I just, it was like you could have punched me in between the eyes. I mean, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat. I didn't know what to do. And then finally, about two weeks into that, I just surrendered to God. And I said, okay, Lord, whatever, whatever you want. Because again, I grew up right here in that church pew Sometimes it's the worst thing to do to grow up on that church pew. You see a lot of things. And I sure have seen a lot of things. But, you know, I, I allowed different things to get into my life. Bitterness mainly was one of those things that I allowed to get into my life. And then at that time, especially, well, a lot of people. It was hard to love people. It's hard to trust people. It was hard to let people into my life because of all the things that had happened to me throughout my life. I mean, you understand that. I assume you do. I know people like it, you know, that they're living in such bitterness and turmoil they don't even know what to do. They don't even know which way is up. They're mad at somebody. They just don't know who it is. They're just upset. And that's no way to live life. And so I had to come to grips with my own salvation. When I came to that point, it was like a load had been lifted off of my life. It was like, I mean, I remember feeling lighter. I remember like I felt like my feet wouldn't touch the ground. It was like months of this. But, at, you know, at some point that runs out. And then it gets real. And then you have to figure out how much do you love Him? How much do you love Him? The Bible says that if you keep his commandments, you show that you love him. Well, there's a few ways to look at that, but let's just look at the commandments. You shall have no other God before you, no worshiping idols. Do not take the Lord's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath. Honor your father and mother. Thou shalt not kill, steal, commit adultery, lie, or covet. Well, that sounds easy enough. But I bet there are people in here that have probably broken these commandments this week. Why is that? Because we are in a constant battle with our flesh. We are cloaked in sin. We are cloaked in sin. We are pulled. Our, our, if we don't allow our spirit man to grow stronger than our flesh man, then we will be pulled down into sin. It is up to us to show that we love God by spending time with Him. I'm as guilty as anybody. Folks, I'm going to tell you, I don't think there's anybody busier than I am. I'll compare my busy to your busy any day of the week. Right, like he said, I own a business. Friday night I'll be in Jonesboro, Arkansas. Got to leave here about 2 o'clock. I'll get back home about 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning. I'll get up Saturday, get ready to coach my son's football team that we have practiced two to three times this week. My daughter has a softball team. We'll, they'll play Tuesday, they'll play Thursday. I won't be able to make it to Thursday because I'll have a, a, a practice that I've got to make and then I've got work full-time job that I work every part of the week and if I'm not working on that then I'm working on the sports network and so when I wake up my day is from one spot to the next and if I miss that spot I have to go on for the rest of the day and try to come back to that spot again tomorrow Okay, so I'm busy, way too busy, just to be quite honest with you. And sometimes I find in that busyness I do not spend the time that I need to with the Lord. Thank God that I have grace. 
But when you don't spend the time that you need to spend with him, then you find yourself pulling away from him. And then you have to figure out, do I correct this and go back toward him or do I just keep going the same way that I go? Do I keep doing the same thing that I do? We do it for so long and then we have gotten far enough away from the Lord. Then we have to say, okay, Lord, that grace, we might need it. Boy, I hope it works for me. I love grace. I thank God for grace. But grace isn't enough to get you there. You got to love Him. You got to love Him. Because look, let's go back to Matthew 25. Let's go back to the five wise and foolish virgins that we were going to come back to. Let me, let me tell you a story real quick before I lose it. Again, I, I, being a hospice chaplain as I am, you know, every day I walk into a situation and it's different. Every day, every door that I walk in is a little different. And last year, around Thanksgiving, um, the day after Thanksgiving, I had to work. Now, you know, and I'm sure some of you have experienced this or may con currently experience this. The day after Thanksgiving, nobody wants to work. They want to be with their family. You know, I did. I didn't have no intention on having to work. I didn't want to, but I had to. So we have a, situ a certain situation that when we get new patients, we have to see them within five days of being put into our system. And most of the time, as the chaplain, they've already been in two days by the time I see them. Or by the time I, on my list, by the time I see them on my list, they've already been here at least two days. So you don't have that much time. Well, this was the fifth day on, on my list. And this man lived out toward Hector. And I called and tried to make sure that they were going to be there, and they were. When I walked into the home that day, I began to talk. Now, I'm not making myself any kind of spiritual guru when I say this. Okay, but I do know when the Lord moves on me. Okay, I do know that. I knew I know that there's a certain thing that happens when I begin to talk, and you know this as well, that the Lord begins to flow. You know, that spirit that's inside of me begins to flow, and I know that God is trying to say something through me. Sitting there, the man's probably 52, 53. Now, obviously, being on hospice, you know, he's He's not going to live forever. But again, I see people all the time. I mean, that, that live, again, I've had people that are still alive from the first day that I started the job. And so this man, while he was sick, I didn't know how sick he was. 53 years old, 52, whatever he was, he didn't look like he was Anything going wrong? I mean, obviously, but you know what I mean. He just wasn't sick, 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 sick to where he was going to die tomorrow. Well, I begin to speak with him, and I begin to feel the Lord unction, you know, felt that unction of the Lord on my life. And I said, sir, I'm going to tell you this. I said, I have no idea. I said, I'm just telling you. I don't come in here and do this on the first time that I visit. Usually I walk in. I introduce myself, I try to get to know them, I try to kind of take the guard down, take the walls down, try to figure out what is going on with those people before I start going in hard and heavy with the Word of God. And I said to him that day, I said, sir, I don't know why, but I said I feel so strongly to talk to you about the Lord. I said I feel so strongly about it. And I, I said, listen, I said, this is, this is not a hard thing. This is an easy thing. I said, do you believe him? Do you believe that he died and rose again for you? He said, I do. I said, do you believe that he's your Savior? I do. He went down the line 
I felt like what, when I left that house, I felt like that we had done enough that day. He died the next day. When I came to work on Monday, and they had said, he died on Saturday, I was floored. Literally floored. Because I knew that God had moved on me in that situation at that time for that person because he needed it. I had no idea that when I left that house, that would be the only time that I saw that man. I felt like that we could cultivate a relationship, we could build a relationship, but I knew that God was moving on me at that time to speak to him about his salvation. That's grace. That's grace. It's a, I hate to say it like this, but it's almost an advantage to go to the altar and he would just take us out. But we wouldn't grow the kingdom that way, would we? If we went to the altar and he just said, boom, we're, we're gone. No, we wouldn't grow, the kingdom wouldn't grow that way. So that was grace that, that helped that man. I believe there'll be a day that I'll go into the heaven and he'll say, thank you for coming by on that day. You saved me a world of torment. I, not, it isn't anything that I did. It was the Lord that led me there that day and the timing was right. Let's go back to the five wise and foolish virgins here. So, as I've already read, there were five that kept the Holy Spirit stirred up in their life. The oil was the representation of the Holy Spirit in their life. There were five that did not. Again, let's, let's go back and say these were pure. These are pure. These are people in my mind. When I think about this, these are people that have come to the altar of prayer at some point in their lives and they have prayed and they have asked the Lord to forgive them they've had a true experience with God but there's been something that has happened inside of their life that they have let the oil of the Holy Spirit go out of their life and because they have let that oil go out their relationship with God has been strained and stretched notice I say strained and stretched because God is always there to pull us back in always there to pull us back in so these these virgins here they they come out and they they notice it in verse five there it says while the bridegroom was delayed they all slumbered think about it this this is such a picture to me of what is going on in the church today is that we have slumbered. We're all asleep. It doesn't make it wrong. But, but, the thing that we have to do is we have to keep the oil stirred up in our lives. We have to keep the Holy Spirit stirred up in our lives. If we don't keep the Holy Spirit stirred up in our lives, how can we say that we're going to make it? How can we say that we love Him? How can we say that we love Him? We have to keep our lamps trimmed. We have to keep them filled up with the oil of the Holy Spirit. One of the things that stuck out to me was this right here. Let me look here. Verse 8. The foolish go to the wise and they say, Give us some of your oil. How many times a Especially in this area. I see it all the time. I ask people, do you believe? Do you believe in the Lord? They say, well, Mama went to church. Mama took me to church. Well, how long has it been? Well, I hadn't been in 40 years. Guys, I, I, it's hard. All I can say is I'm glad I'm not the judge. I'm glad I'm not the one that has to pound the gavel on people that stand before God and say, this is what I've done. This is, these are the things that I've done. You know, when I think about that, that judgment day, I mean, these are the things that cross my mind, you know. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. 
Or, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many. That's what the Bible says, that when we stand before God, these are the things, it's going to be one way or the other. And the only way that I know that we can really stand before God and not be fearful and in trembling is know that we loved Him. Know that we loved Him. Matthew 22, a lot of scripture here today. I, I don't usually use as much scripture, but today is just one of those days. 37 through 40, a very familiar passage of scripture. Jesus said to them, let me back up here, 34 to 40. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. So they came together. They were going to team up on him. <laughs> and then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the greatest of the commandments of the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love your Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And this is the greatest of the commandment. And the second is like, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. They're trying to trip him up. If you think about it, the Pharisees had 613 different things they had to do every single day to make sure that they were in right standing. They were righteous. Now, if you think about that, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, there's 2,440 seconds in a day. And there are 613 things that they had to do. So if you did one thing a second, you would spend about six hours doing all of these things that you're supposed to do. And that was if you were able to do it one thing per second. Their lives were consumed, consumed with what they thought that they needed to do to be righteous. And of course, they were able to puff out their chest. And I'm the righteous one. I am this and I'm that. Jesus comes out here and he's the rebel. And he's like, all oh, this is stupid. You can't do all this stuff. All you have to do is love God and love people. Love God and love people. If you don't love people, and let me just preface by saying, some of them are hard to love. Some of them are hard to love. As a pastor, you know that, don't you? Some of them are hard. But if you don't love God and you don't love people, you don't love, or if you don't, you don't love Him. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you can't love your brother who you do see, how can you love God who you don't? So all of these things that I've talked about boils down to these two things. How do we know that we can get to heaven? Love God and love people and it'll take care of itself. Pretty simple, ain't it? Hard to believe that it comes down to this. How, how do we know that we're saved? Well, we can love people. We can love people. Talk about grace. If we don't show grace to people, how can we expect grace back? Let me tell you something. In the last two to three years of my life, and I'm, I'm talking more away from hospice and more toward the other things that I do, I've had to learn to show grace to people. I've had to learn to allow things to be gone and let go of things and, and things that have come against me. You know, I, I decided I wanted to do something that I wanted to do. I want to see if I could make some money at it. And it took a life of its own. I'm still not quite where I'd like to be with it. But you would think that I had cursed the Trinity to some people of how they have acted toward me. And I've had to learn to show grace. I've had to learn how to truly, truly, and I'm still working on it, truly love people in the best way that I can. 
And yes, I have to pray about it. I sure do. I have to pray about it because if I don't, I ain't going to love somebody. And I've got to figure out how to straighten my, my life, straighten my sight on him. Because really when it boils down to it, when we get down to the very brass tacks of this thing, it's about keeping our eye on Jesus. It's about keeping our eye on the cross and knowing the sacrifice that he made for us and the blood that he shed on Calvary was enough to atone for our sin. And knowing that he laid his life down when he did not have to do that. He could have called the angels down and he didn't. If the musicians will come on back up. So my question to you today, guys, with everybody, everybody has to at some point adjust their sight, has to adjust their walk, has to has to think about where am I really? You know, again, coming down here and praying at the altar, tear stains on it, it's a wonderful sight. But coming down here and doing it one time and walking away from it and saying that's good enough is not enough in my opinion. It's not enough. To, it's not going to be enough for me. It might be for you, and I pray that it is. If that's what you want and that's how you want to live your life, I pray that that is what is enough to get you to heaven because I don't want anybody to go to hell. You say, well, why are you just preaching about going to heaven? There's more things to that. There's more things important than that. Is there? Is there? Is there really? When it gets down to it, is there really more important things than going to heaven? No. No, there's not. Because our life is just a vapor. See it every day, guys. You see it. People leaving this world unexpectedly. Star City, where my wife is from, they lost a teacher yesterday. 37 something years old, just boom, just slumped over on a couch, dead, gone. No warning, no nothing. I pray that God gives me the grace not to have to f see that. But if I live from now, and I hate to even ask this, who's the oldest person in here right now? Who would say I'm, I, I'm probably the oldest? Anybody? <laughs> He's pointing at her. <laughs> Some of you that are, let's just say, I'm going to say 80. Don't, you don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to. Let's just say you're 80. As I live my life at 43, I realize how fast life goes. It goes fast. I feel like, as I gave you my schedule, I feel like that when I go to sleep on Sunday night, it's Friday before I know it. It happens so quickly. And every time we go around that sun, we get a little bit closer. We get a little bit closer to eternity. And this vapor that we live in right here, snap of the fingers is all it is in eternity. 80, 90, 100 years. I have a lady that's 100 years old. She's told me, life, 100 years old isn't as long as you think. Like the old song goes, right? I get to thinking about the scope of life. My, my great-grandfather was born in 1901. My great-grandfather knew people that fought in the Civil War. I knew my great-grandfather, so I have a connection to somebody that fought, or that, that knew people that fought in the Civil War. Civil War is 170 years ago. It's that quick. So my question to you today is this, are you ready and do you love it? If you will, bow your head with me.
This may not be the deepest sermon that you've ever heard, but this is something that has come to me. It just kept coming. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? I can say that I love him. I can say that he has proven himself. I can say that I trust him. But it has taken me time to get there. So my question to you today is, do you love him? Do you need an adjustment? Have you come to the altar one time, two times? It's been years since you came to the altar. And you just need to come back to him. You need to find your first love again. Maybe you need to find that feeling that it was when you first were saved. Maybe, maybe you didn't get a chance to feel that way, but He still loves you. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son to the world to condemn the world, but to save it but to save it. So my question to you is this, do you love him? Would anybody raise their hand today and say, I need an adjustment. I need to adjust my walk with him. I need to come back to him. I need to come to my first love. It may not even mean that you're not saved. It may just mean I need to adjust again. I need to put my, my walk back into perspective. Anybody? But say, I need help with my walk today. There's one. Anybody else? There's another. People are not perfect, folks. I sure am not perfect. Brother Jim's not perfect. But we have a Savior that's here with open arms waiting on you. I don't want to embarrass any of you today. I don't want to do that. And I'll be honest with you today, it ain't anything that I can really do for you, but it's everything that somebody else can do. But I do feel this. If you are a part of the prayer team today, I'd like for you to come up. Thank God for a prayer team. I feel like that this is the best way to go about this. You know, not, not that you're, you're coming up here to be embarrassed, but just somebody to pray with you. Somebody to help you pray. To believe with you, to stand with you, to help you. So today I'm going to ask you, whether you raised your hand or you didn't, and you need prayer, would you come up? Would you be with this prayer team today? Would you help them? Would you... Would you allow them to pray with you, to help you in your walk today? Anybody? Bring somebody up here with you if you have to. I mean, everybody needs an adjustment, folks. This is not anything but just saying, I need help. I need help. Anybody? Well, I know for sure, I know that the Lord gave me this word for somebody. Maybe more than one than somebody. So here's what I'd like to do. Because I know that there's a little bit of fear in here today about coming up. I want to just open the altars up to everybody. Would you come up? Would you sit, have some time in prayer before we go, before we leave this room today? And if you needed that adjustment, go ahead. If you want somebody to pray with you, but I'm going to open it up to everybody, if you will. Come on up and uh, let's get let's have some prayer time today. Anybody? Yes, there's room yes. at the cross for you. No.
Steve.